Do you work for a company or do you work on your own? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I do work on a company. The reason I work for a company is simply because space is very, very complicated. And uh, one thing you've probably learned today is that there are lots of different disciplines who all have to work together to figure out how to land on the moon. And so I work for a company. I work in the surface side, so I'm looking at the lunar surface, and also some of the flight analysis, which means I figure out how do we get from the surface of Earth to the surface of the moon, because these two things, they're not stationary in space. They're rotating around each other and doing all sorts of crazy things. Um, but I work with a lot of people who are very, very talented in all sorts of different uh, science, but also in uh, law and in uh, communication and, and engineering and all sorts of um, really cool different aspects. So if you're interested in space exploration, then I really hope you, you take on it, because it's a really cool thing to do, and you can do anything. Thank you. And I saw a hand up at the front. Did you have a question? No? OK. Somebody else in the center up, up there. Yep. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, the graphic you put up with the domed environment, you know, living area, yep. astronaut. Yeah. Who built the dome? Given uh, you're going to put people onto the planet. Are where you were they going to live before that's built? That one. Yep. This one? So there are several uh, there are several things you can do here. In fact, I wish I, the European Space Agency has a really good video of this. Um, but the, the the kind of common theme right now. So there's two ways essentially to protect from from radiation, which is you burrow, you or go into a lava tube, which uh, exists already in situ on the moon, or you can essentially pile lunar regolith on top of your structure or 3D print lunar regolith on top of the structure. So uh, laser sintering is something that is being actively researched. In fact, and with our company. We are sending a payload to the moon, which is going to be the first ever um, example uh, of laser sintering, We're essentially using a laser to melt regolith and fuse it into a structure that can then be uh, 3D printed. And so you see this aluminum dome, uh, aluminum uh, tube. The reason that is like that is because that is a, um, essentially an ISS style module. It's kind of four by four um, module that can be landed and simply tilted. And then from that, you can inflate a structure around the back. And then you have already a, a habitable volume. So inflatable structures in space are actually super interesting and super exciting because what they allow us to do is to um, increase the volume that you can have for living while minimizing the amount of mass you have to take there, which is the game that we're constantly playing. And so with this uh, idea in particular, I would imagine um, the, the 3D printing robot on the right-hand side is being used either by uh, autonomously from ground or from the gateway, which is a new space station being planned to be built in the 2020s around the moon, and can be tele-operated tele by astronauts on the space station to print a structure over an already existing habitat before humans get there. Um, what are the current sort of international arrangements with access to the moon, and do different space agencies discuss things, or you know, is there mm. a dialogue, or is it just a free-for-all? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, this is an incredibly complex point. And again, I'll caveat this by saying I'm not a space lawyer. Um, but the, it's a really, really complex point. And actually, uh, in, in the Royal Institution, there was a talk about this not so long ago from a, a space lawyer based in London. And it's really interesting. So there are a few uh, basic big points, which is what happens if you take some stuff on the moon? Is it yours? Can you bring it back to Earth and sell it? Right now, the kind of general idea is no. But also, uh, the moon is treated very much like international waters. So really, there's nothing anyone can do. Um, regarding the Apollo site, so our company, we want to land near Apollo 17, because scientifically, it's very, very interesting. The, the lunar science community is very invested in us going to this mission. NASA is very excited by us going to this, uh, going to this site. But we recognize that the lunar uh, landing sites are heritage. And actually, there is a um, foundation and organization called For All Moonkind who have designated the Apollo, astronauts, uh, the Apollo sites as heritage sites, that you can't um, destroy them, harm them, tamper with them. You can't take an astronaut's poop bag or a golf club that's lying on the moon and come back and sell it and, and make millions. Um, and so we're working really closely with NASA to define this boundary. In terms of the international scene, it's the same idea. So the European Space Agency, uh, and NASA, Roscosmos, all these people, Chinese space agency, they all have separate plans for going to the moon. 
and they also all have a dialogue on the best way to do this that can benefit each other. So it's a really, really complex problem, but this, to summarize, Basically, there is no uh, legal framework whatsoever. Um, and NASA has these Apollo Heritage Guidelines, and they openly admit that they are guidelines. They're saying, hey, please don't do this. Don't damage the Apollo 11 site and the Apollo 17 site in particular, because they're the first and last. But if anyone was to, there is no legal um, punishment for that. Um, but rest assured, I think everyone in a, with the capability to do this kind of mission uh, is, is very, very invested in protecting um, these sites and the, and the moon in general, because that's what it's all, all of our passion. Um, <clears throat> uh, while accepting your argument for going to the moon, I also wanted to ask your opinion of further development of the International Space Station mm. as a platform for uh, going into space and developing Mars and other missions. Yeah, so the current uh, theme with the International Space Station is it's being passed on to commercial actors. So NASA, uh, it's in a new position whereby private companies now have the technology to do things that they could never do before without uh, necessarily having NASA's support. Um, and so uh, NASA has taken the idea that they are to manage the really high-risk programs, things like lunar exploration, Martian exploration, and uh, big science missions that cost billions of dollars. Uh, and so they started to sell um, space on the, on, the, on the ISS. So it was a few months ago they announced that you can now become a uh, tourist for much cheaper than ever before. Uh, and this has changed with the um, implementation of new American launchers. So we now have potentially three spaceships that are American that will launch to the ISS within the next year, which is incredible. We're at a time in our lives where there's three spaceships being built from different people to go to a space station. Like, this is incredible. It's crazy. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, further, the further development of the ISS, I'm not so sure, because the infrastructure itself, it costs a lot of money. To build a module and to launch it costs a huge amount of money. But the ISS is, is really huge. And in fact, my old boss, I was an intern at the European Astronaut Center, was Samantha Cristoforetti, who is a, an Italian astronaut. And she told me that the ISS is huge. She's like, it feels like a giant hotel. There's no need for it to be that big um, for six-month missions. There's lots of room to float about and, and have fun. So yeah, I think very much that we, we should continue access to low-Earth orbit. Um, because it's where we can do lots of science, it's much cheaper to get to, uh, and that will inherently lower the access to space for the rest of us, while the, um, some of the more bolder, riskier missions are managed or are done in partnership with the big agencies, because that's where like, political support, public support, and, and ultimately funding comes from. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of problems with an Earth-based space elevator. But a moon-based space elevator um, is arguably a lot more, um, a lot more feasible, but a uh, very costly investment. You'll break even in a few million years, maybe. <laughs> I'm not sure. Thank you. And ready in the gallery? Yep. I have, to, I have two questions. Sure. The first one is, so there's this website where you can buy an, where you can buy an acre, of land on Venus and Mars for sixteen pounds seventy five. Yep. Like is like is that legal? <laughs> Did someone buy you Venus or Mars for your birthday? No, I just heard of it. I've just um, heard of it. I'll be careful with what I say because I'm not sure of the legality, but what I can tell you is that the people who own those pieces of paper certainly don't own any space on Venus or Mars, or the moon for that matter. My second question is that, when do you think we'll be able to land on or colonize exoplanets? Exoplanets, as in outside of the solar system? Yeah. That's a very, very difficult question. The problem with exoplanets is they're simply incredibly far away. Uh, with our current technology, propulsion technology, we basically we burn uh, fuel uh, create an explosion and direct the explosion so that we get pushed away. Um, it's a very inefficient method when it comes to dealing with distances that are very, very vast. The, the distance to the nearest star is on the order of four light years, um, which means if you were to travel at the speed of light, which is obviously impossible for us at the moment, uh, it would take you four years to get there. Um, so it's a really, really difficult question. I would hope within a thousand years as a, as a guess. Um, but one thing I think you should look up is a, is a project called Breakthrough Starshot, which was funded by um, a Russian billionaire and um, 
whose name I should know, I'm sorry, I forgot, and Stephen Hawking, the late Stephen Hawking, and they plan to um, accelerate a postage size stamp uh, camera to Proxima Centauri at 0.2 times the speed of light. So it should take 20 years to get there and then send back four years later the first images from another solar system. And that is the first step towards, towards uh, at least exploring, if not colonizing, uh, exoplanets. Thank you. And was there another question in the gallery to stop Dominique having to run everywhere? Yep. <laughs> Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, the Earth has a water cycle. Yep. The moon doesn't. The moon does have a water cycle. Does it? It does, indeed. Yeah. Okay. Because I was thinking that maybe the water on the, on the moon is a, is a finite resource. It absolutely is a finite resource, but there is a water cycle. Um, again, this is much more in the realm of uh, planetary science than, than I have a background in astrophysics, so I forgive me, I'm not entirely sure how it works. Um, but essentially, the idea is that uh, water is implanted into the lunar surface by the solar wind, um, and so you, this process happens, um, and the, the concept I tried to communicate in, in the talk, which may, was not so clear because I kind of dodged it, uh, is that the water ends up in these craters via, via this process, kinetic process, because it lands in what's called a cold trap, which is that it's so cold in the craters, it saps instantly all the kinetic energy, and so the water lies in the poles. But you are absolutely right. On our timescales, it's a, it's a finite resource. However, we estimate that there's more than 100 to 300 million tons of water trapped in the North and South Pole. And so as it stands, I don't think we're at any, um, any risk of running out anytime soon. But you're, we need to think about it, and that's for sure. And I think one thing that's become clear in the space industry with the problem of space debris and all these other things is that we can't continue the, the very typical uh, human colonization, which is kind of a, a derogatory buzz, buzz term now, uh, that we just go and ruin other places. So we really try to think about how do we do this sustainably without damaging the, the, the local environment. Thank you. And was there a question over here? Yeah. I got myself there. Um, I heard about terraforming mm. other planets. Is that possible? Um, again, a very, very complicated question. It depends who you ask. Some people will say absolutely yes. Some people will say absolutely no. I would say uh, currently I don't think we have a, a true understanding of the scale of what, of what that would take. The, the basic concept here is that Mars uh, has an atmosphere and it also has a lot of CO2 and a lot of oxygen um, trapped in the poles. And so if you can warm up the poles and melt water, you can raise the pressure of the atmosphere such that liquid water can exist on the surface. Right now it's below what's called the triple point, which is where essentially the water will sublimate before, uh, it won't boil, it won't turn as liquid, it'll sublimate straight from ice into gas. So liquid water just cannot exist. Uh, in a pure form on the surface of, of Mars. But if we can find a way to heat Mars up, we can increase the pressure by melting the polar caps. And so essentially we need to try and induce a greenhouse effect on Mars. How we would actually do that, it, some people argue that there's not enough CO2 in the atmosphere. Some people say that we could mine it from Jupiter and take it back, but that's incredibly costly. Um, so I think in the, at least in the near term, there will be no uh, large scale terraforming on Mars. Thank you. And oh, we've got a question up there on the right, and we'll come down there. And there was a hand up here as well. Yes. And then I think that'll be it. Cool. So colonies, kind of the dream, going from these isolated posts to sustainable places mm. with jobs and industry. Yep. What kind of products could the moon produce that Earth would want? Because that would be its only trading party uh, partner that Earth can't produce on its own. Yeah. Um, so one of the, the main things that I mentioned is fuel. Um, but another, another uh, aspect of this, this colony argument um, is science. The moon is an incredible place to perform science that we simply can't do here on Earth. One of the examples is um, deep space radio telescopes. If you place a, because of, like I, I mentioned, that the Earth is uh, tidally locked to the, uh, the moon is tidally locked to the Earth so that, that it's always facing us with the same familiar face. Uh, that if we go on the other side and put a deep space radio telescope, we immediately block out all the noise from Earth. And so we can do more sensitive measurements than we've ever done before. Um, but more than that, we have uh, in, the, in the very far future um, mining for rare earth um, materials, which exist in uh, abundances we're not quite sure of, but are theorized to exist in higher abundances on the moon than, than on the Earth. But then also um, the 
the service, I think, is, is the main thing, the service of providing uh, access to deeper space. So as we go further into space for things like asteroid mining, um, I would be, I'd be probably pretty confident to say that the first person who, uh, CEO, shareholder of a major company, who manages to mine an asteroid will become the world's first private trillionaire. Uh, there, are, there are so many abundant um, rare metals like nickel and platinum, which we use increasingly in electronics. Um, in the asteroid belt, that if you can get your hands on them and mine it, and have the legal uh, right to sell it, then yeah, you're you're set. I mean, it's just it's just resources. Um, and and the other thing I wanted to mention actually, which I think is a really interesting point that most people don't think about, uh, that if we can sustainably colonize the moon or even in orbits around the moon, we can begin to move industry off Earth. And so if we can get rid of all of the dirty industry off Earth, stop burning coal and all these things that we just know are inherently uh, ineffective and, and quite damaging, then we can zone Earth as a residential area and just have all of um, the solar system to play with and, and to generate solar energy, to generate nuclear fusion or fission or, or whatever. The possibilities truly are endless. Thank you. Yep. Oh, just down here. Well, the, um, you think we should go to the moon before we go to Mars. Yes. Uh, how do you feel about SpaceX's plans for 2024, is it? Yes, uh, this is a very bold, uh, I don't know if you have been following Elon Musk's timelines, they're known uh, to be taken with a pinch of salt. Uh, and actually, um, the thing with SpaceX is they're a private company. And uh, ultimately, they will follow the money because they want to create real estate and they want to stay as one of the, the top players in the space industry. They have done some amazing things. And they have just recently launched a constellation of satellites to low Earth orbit because other people are doing the same thing uh, to create communication webs. And so I believe that if we uh, show that the moon to be a, a fruitful commercial uh, location, SpaceX will, will follow. But I think they'll use that as funding to get to Mars because Elon Musk is very, very clear. His ultimate goal is to land on Mars. He wants to die on Mars, but just not on impact, I think is what he usually says. <laughs> Last question. So a lot of my questions already actually been answered, but I guess you know, with SpaceX and the kind of continued delay that you get with things like the SLS, with the, yep. uh, with the US, do you feel that private space companies have like a responsibility um, to avoid kind of like over commercializing uh, the moon and other kind of planets? Yeah, it's a, this is a really interesting point and it's a difficult question. Um, I don't have anything really uh, truly philosophical to say, unfortunately, to, to end. But um, what I would say is that my background was always in, in science and in astrophysics, uh, at least in university. And I always thought of space exploration as this pure thing and it shouldn't be spoiled by um, people trying to make money from it and things like that. And then I realized actually that that's just not uh, a realistic, it's a very naive view of the world. And actually what you do if you make space profitable is you make it accessible and then you make the benefits from space accessible. And the same reason uh, that we had um, straight like beam to TV, television and GPS and all these incredible things that have come from space. Uh, the reason they're beneficial is because everyone in the world can use them, or everyone with access can use them. The GPS has changed the way that we we live. Um, and so commercializing the moon, I think, is the same thing. And I think within my lifetime, if everything goes to plan, then I think we should be able to go to the moon uh, on holiday, on a science expedition, on, on all these things, because companies uh, like ours and like SpaceX and Blue Origin and all the other people are lowering the costs and making it... Um, safe, reliable, and ultimately cheaper to get to the moon. Thank you very much, everyone, for your questions. And a huge round of applause. And thank you for Callum. Thank you. Thank you.